there's always a lot of questions and confusion about the idea of C.G. Jung's Red Book. So today I thought I would read a sort of definition of it. So this is the Logos approach to Dr. Jung's Red Book, although his Red Book is founded in Eros entirely. But uh, this was sent to me from um, Louis LaFontaine, who operates the Carl Jung Deaf Psychology site dot blog. And this is an essay which was written by two very famous Jungian analysts, uh, Lance Owens and Stephen Heller. And it's called Carl Gustav Jung and the Red Book, Lieber Nova, Lieber. <laughs> Carl Gustav Jung and the Red Book, Lieber Novus. Carl Gustav Jung and the Red Book, Lieber Novus. And this was an essay that they put together in 2014 for the Encyclopedia of Psychology and Religion. And it's uh, published as a Springer reference. I don't quite know what Springer reference means, but in any case, uh, let, I will read to you their description of the Red Book. And as I do that, what I am showing in the slideshow to over my right shoulder is a series of images that actually appear in the Red Book, because I think a lot of people who know about the Red Book, don't necessarily know what its contents are. And, and so um, what I'm doing is showing some of the contents as I talk. And so, oh, I guess I'm not doing that right now. Now I'm doing it. <laughs> And uh, so anyway, uh, these images are various images from the Red Book. All of these images were done by Dr. Jung himself. And all of the German calligraphy, which you see in the image right now, uh, is also done by Dr. Jung himself over a 16-year period. And one of the images, uh, which will come up in a moment, will show Dr. Jung's actual red book lying on his desk. And let me see if I can get these images so I can also see them. Um, all right. And so I will be reading this essay and as I do so, I will stop from time to time to look for your comments and questions. And um, so, let me begin. Description. The Red Book is an exquisite red leather bound folio manuscript crafted by the Swiss psychologist and physician Carl Gustav Jung between 1915 and about 1930. It recounts and comments upon the author's imaginative experiences between 1913 and 1916, and is based on manuscripts first drafted by Jung in 1914-15 and 1917. Despite being nominated as the central work in Jung's oeuvre, it was not published or made otherwise accessible for study until 2009. While the work has in past years been descriptively called the Red Book, Jung did emboss a formal title on the folio spine. He titled the work Liber Novus, The New Book. Hello, Grenad and Miles, welcome. Um, Interesting point, Miles. Miles is working on the Canadian Constitution, and uh, 
Um, the art that I'm showing is only a very small portion of the paintings that appear in the Red Book. And um, so, composition and, let's see. Okay, his manuscript is now increasingly cited as Liber Novus, and under this title implicitly includes draft material intended for, but never transcribed into the red leather folio proper. And what you just saw was the actual red book that Dr. Jung kept on his desk for about 50 years. Composition and publication. Liber Novus contains a literary and artistic recension of what has been called Jung's confrontation with the unconscious, an intense period of imaginative activity accompanied by waking visions that began in 1913 and continued with variable intensity for about six years. In his biographical memoir, Jung clearly announced the centrality of these events to his life's work. Speaking to Aniela Jaffe in 1957, Jung stated, the years when I pursued the inner images were the most important time of my life. Everything else is to be derived from this. Everything later was merely the outer classification, the scientific elaboration, and the integration into life but the numinous beginning, which contained everything, was then. Nonetheless, throughout his life, and for nearly a half century after his death, the details of what happened during this period remained a mystery. Lacking access to Jung's own primary records, historians, biographers, and critics struggled to contextualize or understand these seminal years of activity and their profound influence upon his later work. C.G. Jung kept an extensive and detailed record of his, of his imaginative and visionary experiences, an endeavor he initially referred to as my most difficult experiment. First, there were six sequentially dated journals, known as the Black Books, so named because of their black covers, which he began on the night of 12 November 1913 and continued recording through the early 1920s. The journals are the record of his experiment and might be described as his contemporaneous ledger of a voyage of discovery into an imaginative inner world in Liber Novus, he explains, this inner world is truly infinite, in no way poorer than the outer one. Man lives in two worlds. During the initial months of fantasy activity, Jung conceived of his activity as primarily referent to his personal situation. After the outbreak of World War, after the outbreak of the World War in August 1914, an event presaged in visions Jung had recorded during the prior winter, the magnitude and meanings of his experience constellated in a broader context. What he had what he had endured apparently had more than personal import. It was a reflection of a crucial cultural moment and it needed formal record. He began that record by compiling an approximately 1,000 page draft manuscript detailing the initial flood of imaginative material recorded in his Black Book journals between November 13, between November 1913 and April 1914, adding further reflections on its meaning. With this protean draft at hand, he next turned to creating an enduring testament of the experience. With, with prodigious artistic craft, 
employing antique illuminated calligraphy and stunning imagery. He labored for 16 years, translating the manuscript records of his experiences into an elegant folio-sized leather-bound volume. This is the Red Book, titled Liber Novus, the New Book. Despite his extended labors on this transcription and accompanying symbolic artwork, the book was never finished. Only approximately two-thirds of the text Jung compiled was transcribed into the Red Book. The remainder survives in his draft manuscripts. Jung did not record Liber Novus as a private aesthetic pretension. He clearly addressed it to readers in some future time, though from the beginning he was never quite sure when that time might come. During his life, Jung eventually allowed only a handful of his students and colleagues to examine the work. After his death in 1961, his heirs refused all requests for access to the Red Book and related materials. Finally, in 2009, with full cooperation of Jung's estate, and after 13 years of exhaustive editorial work by Dr. Sonu Shamdasani, the Red Book, Liber Novus, was published in a full-size facsimile edition, complete with an English translation. The concluding portions of manuscripts not transcribed into the Red Book volume, a comprehensive introduction, and over 1,500 editorial notes, including excerpts from Jung's Black Book journals and other previously unknown contemporaneous documents. Editions in multiple languages soon followed. In some, publication of the Red Book, Liber Novus, signaled a watershed moment in the uns signaled a signaled a watershed moment in the understanding of the life and work of C.G. Jung. In its light, Jung's legacy is undergoing an intense reconsideration. Now, one thing I would mention here is that if you consider purchasing a copy of the Red Book, the Reader's Edition, which is only about $25 on Amazon, does not contain any of the images, which I'm showing here on this slideshow, for example. And these are only a few of the images that are actually in the book. And so if you want to purchase a copy of the Red Book, I urge you to purchase the folio edition, which is the size of the book you see on the screen there, and which um, costs about $150 at Amazon. It's a non-trivial expense. But if you don't have a cop have access to a copy, maybe you can find it at the library. Uh, now I'm going to go on with this, but let me just look at this. Uh, the Grenade says CJ had a wild level of introverted intuition. Well, yes, he did. And Miles says, I am going to send this to a talented artist friend of mine. One day I looked one day I took a pen to paper and drew out a circle of various iconic-like symbols. I find them paradoxically meaningful and mysterious. And yes, that makes a, a lot of sense. And uh, I think Dr. Jung put many artists to shame as he was doing his work. So in any case, uh, it would be important for you to have a look at the actual images and you can also go on to Google and get quite a number of the images uh, through various publications that you can find through Google. Just put uh, the Red Book images and many choices will pop up if you just want to get a quick look at them. And hello Lucky Doer, welcome, good morning. Okay, and one other thing I would add here is that in the description of this video, beneath the video, you will find a number of definitions because uh, unfortunately Jungian analysts are given to use 
very complicated words sometimes, words that most of us don't often run into. So I would urge you to look under this video for the definitions of some words. Now keep in mind also that uh, Dr. Jung was a psychiatrist. By the time this Red Book period began, he had already been practicing for nearly 15 years, including in a mental asylum in Zurich called the Bergoldsli. And he had experienced the visions of many mentally ill patients. And so he knew quite a lot about what was going on in the unconscious. And one of the issues that he had with Dr. Freud, which he could never get over, was that Dr. Freud insisted on a materialistic view of life, namely the logos. This is an issue that I often raise on my videos, that Dr. Freud's perspective was the logos. And so that plays out in mental health, at least in the United States, where if you go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, they may give you pharmaceuticals, drugs to cure your problem. And unfortunately, in the United States, uh, overuse of narcotics has led to 62,000 deaths last year. And so we need to re rethink our mental health approach. And so the, the Logos approach is, if you give somebody this drug, this will make them stop having their depression or whatever it is. But unfortunately, they can get addicted to it too. And in depth psychology, uh, what Jungian analysts are doing is going into depth and helping you um, see the problem at a deeper level and therefore, if not cure you, Dr. Jung didn't believe that you were ever cured from neur neurosis or psychosis, but if they don't cure you, at least they can show you a way to package up your neurosis and put it over in a corner of your psyche where it won't bother you quite so much. And so let's see. Um, and Miles says, does the unconscious speak to us in our doodles? Yes. And I think if you listen to the beginning of session 103, uh, you'll hear what, uh, um, what the young woman, T Tina Keller, Jenny, had to say about that, where she said that it was actually better if you were a poor artist because it came out more, um, more naturally. And that was Doctor's, Dr. Young's point. He wanted, um, he found a source of the power of our lives, and that was the unconscious, which is an instinctual level and a natural level. And so when things are coming out of you spontaneously, you're calling upon that part of your psyche. Uh, you know, somebody can take you and teach you how to draw in a very pedantic way, and maybe you can draw as good as a photograph, but that won't express very much of your emotion. And so that was my experience where um, I had a, a painting teacher who was teaching me pa pastels and we were drawing a portrait and she came up behind me and she said, no, no, you have to do it this way. And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is my way and I'm going to do it my way. And so you want to do your artwork your way because that's coming from your deep unconscious. And so Grenad says, uh, that's very helpful having the definitions there. I always find myself Googling words during these. 
Miles says, great artists dead due to opioids. Prince Michael Jackson, Tom Petty, and more. Yes, very much so. Okay, going on. The Threshold Vision. A comprehensive understanding of Liber Novus requires considerable... I'm sorry. Yeah requires consideration of the singular visionary activity underlying the text, the hermeneutic method, the hermeneutic method employed in translating these imaginative experiences in, uh, to literary form. The hermeneutic method of the hermeneutic method employed in translating these imaginative experiences into literary form, the signal themes emerging from the book as a whole, and the influence of the entire project on Jung's subsequent work. Among these tasks, understanding what Jung experienced in his waking dreams or visions, the imaginative activity that is foundational to Liber Novus is perhaps the primary and most difficult one. For several years prior to 1913, Jung's interest had focused on the evidence he saw in myths, dreams, fantasies, and psychotic delusions to an autonomous myth-making function inherently underlying human consciousness. The psyche, the soul, seemingly expressed itself in an arcane language of myth and symbol. To further understand the psyche, Jung recognized a need to investigate this mytho Jung recognized a need to investigate this mythopoetic substratum of consciousness. During the same period, he was increasingly disillusioned with theoretical constructs about the origin and nature of unconscious contents, a disenchantment that led to termination of his six-year misadventure with Freud. As he explained in the draft manuscript of Liber Novus, speaking of his situation around this time, I had to accept that what I had previously called my soul was not at all my soul, but a dead system that I had contrived. Around the big, around the beginnings of 1913, Jung noted growing internal turmoil. This crested in October of 1913, when he was overcome by the spontaneous and detailed vision of a monstrous flood of blood covering all of Northern Europe up to the Alps. The same vision recurred two weeks later and again lasted for about an hour. The eruption of two visual hallucinations, pretending vast death and destruction, caused Jung to fear that he was menaced by a psychosis. Over the next weeks, he outwardly surveyed his situation, seeking some therapeutic or palliative insight. Finding none, he determined to search inward, and so, on the evening of 12 November 1913, Jung sat at his desk, opened his journal, and addressed the mystery petitioning him. My soul, where are you? Do you hear me? I speak. I call you. Are you there? I have returned. I am here again. I have shaken the dust of all the lands from my feet, and I have come to you. I am with you. After long years of long wandering, I have come to you again. Now, obviously, uh, this is not within the context of concepts, which is what the Logos is about. And so to the extent that you're working with Logos, you're working with concepts. But these concepts are dead, and in order to have meaning of concepts, you have to put life into them. As, uh, let's see, 
as Leonardo da Vinci once said, he who has access to the fountain does not go to the water jar. And so Leonardo would call the water jar logos. This is what you get when you listen to a essay like this, which is part of the logos because it's the word, but you have to put eros into it. You have to decide the meaning of it to you. Um, so, carrying on. This journal entry begins the record that became Liber Novus, but the course then before him was obscure. He had no theory or concept to explain what he was doing, whom he was addressing, or how he should proceed. He determined to simply let things happen, let the unconscious have a voice. During 25 subsequent evenings, he practiced turning off outward consciousness and engaging any awaiting unconscious contents. Slowly responses began to come, finding voice through him. He explained, sometimes it was as if I were hearing it with my ears, sometimes feeling it with my mouth, as if my tongue were formulating words. Now and then I heard myself whispering aloud. By early December 1913, Jung discovered that his focused imaginative activity could evoke autonomous visionary scenes, personages, and dialogic interactions. The initial vision is recorded in his journal on 12 December 1913 and recounted in Liber Novus, the spirit of the depths opened my eyes and I caught a glimpse of the inner things, the world of my soul, the many formed and changing. In the introduction to Liber Novus, Dr. Shamdasani further explains, from December 1913 onward, he carried on in the same procedure, deliberately evoking a fantasy in a waking state and then entering into it as into a drama. These fantasies may be understood as a type of dramatized thinking in pictorial form. In retrospect, he recalled that his scientific question was to see what took place when he switched off consciousness. The example of dreams indicated the existence of background activity, and he wanted to give this a possibility of emerging, just as one does when taking mescaline. With almost nightly frequency through dis with almost nightly frequency through January 1914, and then more sporadically until the early summer of 1914, Jung volitionally engaged visual fantasies or visions. He recorded about 35 major visionary episodes in his journals during this period. These accounts, along with commentary appended the next year, comprise the first and second sections, Liber Primus and Liber Secundus, of Liber Novus. The majority of this material was recorded into the red folio, into the red leather folio. A final section, compiled in 1917, entitled Scrutinies, adds accounts of a second period of visionary activity between late 1915 and 1916. This last section exists in draft manuscript and contains Jung's summary revelation to Liber Novus, the Septum Sermones Ad Mortuus, Seven Sermons to the Dead. Independently titled and privately printed by Jung in 1916, These summary sermons comprise a vast cosmogonic myth and are the only portion of Liber Novus disclosed and distributed by Jung during his lifetime. Thematic 
content of Liber Novus. While many alternative summaries are possible, the following list reflects themes Jung focused upon in his own consideration of the text. Reclaiming the soul. At the, at the outset of his experiment, Jung recognized the need to reclaim and revalorize something lost and forgotten in his age. In the opening pages of Liber Novus, the primordial power of the spirit of the depths confronts the arrogant spirit of this time, the secular materialism and, posit and positivistic science that dominates European culture. The spirit of the depths instructs Jung to turn away from the spirit of the time and to look into the depths, to speak to his soul, to call upon her as a living and self-existing being. Liber Novus accounts Jung's struggle to reclaim the soul, and it exposes the method by which he rate, and exposes the method by which he revalorizes the soul's mythopoetic and symbolic voice, experiencing God. Earlier in the dialogue, Jung petitions his soul. I am ignorant of your mystery. Forgive me if I speak as in a dream, like a drunkard. Are you God? This question resonates throughout Liber Novus. In his journey through vision, Jung confronts God not as a theological concept, but as an experience encompassing light and dark qualities, and as a fact in intimate relationship with human consciousness. Renewing the, renewing the God image in a key f renewing the God image in a keynote fantasy, Jung meets Isdbar, an ancient god from the east. The meeting goes tragically wrong. Confronted by Jung's toxic modernity, Isdbar is stricken and sickened unto death. The dying Isdbar asks Jung if his western lands have gods. Jung replies, no, just words. Having lost contact with the experience of deity, only verbal concepts remained. Jung undertakes the healing and regeneration of the stricken god. A theophanic recognition ensues. I am the egg that surrounds and nurtures the seed of the God in time. Imitating Christ, his visions inexorably led Jung toward confrontation with the Imitatio Christi. This becomes a leitmotif throughout Liber Novus. Jung surveys what it means to be not just a Christian believer, but a Christ a full and conscious participant in the act of redemption. Near the end of Liber Novus, Christ appears in a vision and is addressed. My master and my brother, I believe you have completed your work. What one individual can do for men, you have done and accomplished and fulfilled. The time has come when each must do his own work of redemption. Mankind has grown older, and a new month has begun. Harrowing Hell In an astonishing passage, Jung declares, No one knows what happened during the three days Christ was in hell. I have experienced it. Indeed, two evenings after witnessing a rebirth of the God, which he describes as a vision of eternal light, immeasurable and overpowering, Jung descends into hell. He confronts the ultimate darkness of evil. This horror he must acknowledge as resident within himself and all humankind. He concludes, man must recognize his complicity in the act of evil. The work of redemption demands conscious confrontation with the existential fact of evil. 
The work of redemption demands conscious confrontation with the existential fact of evil. Conjoining opposites. Throughout Liber Novus, Jung attempts to come to terms with what has been rejected with the opposite, the adversary, the missing half that brings wholeness and heals the wound of one-sided consciousness. He explains, you begin to have a presentment of the whole when you embrace your opposite principle, since the whole belongs to both principles which grow from one root. In Liber Novus, unification of the opposites has not only personal developmental implications, but also a but also a profound sotio, soteriological function, but also a profound soteriological function. Soteriological means a study of religious doctrines of salvation. Okay, so let me read that sentence again. In Liber Novus, unification of the opposites has not only personal development in, has not only personal development implications, but also a profound soteriological function. Prophesying a new age, Liber Novus has a distinctly prophetic temper, tenor. Liber Novus has a distinctly prophetic tenor. While Jung adamantly rejected the mantle of prophet, his new book, certainly challenges readers with its prophetic voice. On the first folio page of Liber Novus, Jung begins by quoting Latin Vulgate verses from Isaiah and the Gospel of John. Prophetic words read over two millennia, prophetic words read over two millennia as prelude and prologue of the Christian age. Even the title, Liber Novus, the new book, asks readers to contextualize his text against historically received testaments of prophetic vision. A comment by Jung, recorded in 1923, places the book's tenor in an even stranger perspective. Jung privately avowed to a close disciple his impression the guided figure behind Liber Novus was the same who inspired Buddha, Mani, Christ, Muhammad, all those who may be said to have communed with God. Among many possible readings, Liber Novus can be read as a prophetic book, and throughout Liber Novus, one paramount prophetic declaration recurs. The Christian age has reached its terminus. The ion of Pisces is nearing its end. Humankind stands at the difficult threshold. Humankind stands at the difficult threshold of a new age of consciousness, heralded by a transforming divine image. Jung had seen it. Influence on Jung's later work. C.G. Jung has most frequently been categorized encyclopedically as psychologist and founder of analytical psychology, but Liber Novus, described by its editor as the book that stands at the center of his oeuvre, is distinctly not a clinical or theoretical work of psychology. The word psychology does not appear in the text even once. If this is the foundation of Jung's life work, or as Jung said, the numinous beginning which contained everything, then his work has to date then his work has to date been inadequately contextualized and too narrowly characterized. Between 1913 between 1913 and about 1920, Jung's engagement with imagination and its mythopoetic voice offer direct empirical evidence of an apparently autonomous psychoid realm underlying consciousness. 
though it was a rare experience, focused engagement and dialogue with this otherwise inherently unconscious dimension opened measureless perspectives on the nature of consciousness itself. While potentially overwhelming and disorienting, the process of ex the process of accessing and interacting with this realm through functions of dream, fantasy, imagination, and vision had a transformative and expansive effect on human consciousness. This Jung witnessed with his own life. Jung's experiment, formally documented in Liber Novus, provided him with a unique perspective on mystical and revelatory religious experience and on the general human propensity for mythic and imaginative expression. The primary hermeneutic task of translating into text and symbolic image his own encounter with mythopoetic imagination subsequently informed his recognition and appreciation of other similar enterprises in history. His extensive writings on mythology, Eastern and Western religious traditions, alchemy, hermeticism, and Gnosticism are all influenced by a hermeneutics of human imagination and vision grounded in his own experiences recorded in Liber Novus. The reas the, rea the reassessment of Jung's life and work under the revelatory light of Liber Novus is a generational task only recently begun. As this effort proceeds and the foundation of C.G. Jung's hermeneutic enterprise is better understood, it is likely that the influence and appreciation of his work will reach far beyond the cloisters of analytic psychology. As Sonusham Dasani suggested shortly after its publication of Liber As Sonusham Dasani suggested shortly after publication of Liber Novus, if, as Jung claimed, Dante and Blake closed vi clothed visionary experience in mythological forms, could we not pose the question? Did Jung in turn attempt to clothe visionary experience in conceptual psychological forms? If so, the power and significance of this work does not reside in his concepts, which are familiar to us, but in the visionary experience, which was at the back of them. Okay, that's the end of the essay. Um, let me see what other comments we have. Bernard says, I wonder if God forgets his true nature because it is a fun thing to do, or her. <laughs> Good question. Uh, Miles says, I will catch the replay going to Banff in the Rocky Mountains. Sun is in a parade. It's cold. He will need long underwear. I'm sure that's true. Anyway, um, this has been a reading of an essay by Dr. Lance Owens and Dr. Stephen Heller on Dr. Jung's The Red Book, Liber Novus, and it should be considered a Logos attempt to describe Liber Novus, I would have to say that it in no way encompasses the Eros aspect of Liber Novus, which you can only experience yourself and individually by actually looking at a copy of the book. And so this is why I've left the slideshow going uh, next to my right shoulder here so that you can have a sense of some of the images which are in this book. And remember that um, the Red Book is sold in two versions. In the Reader's Edition, there are no images, so uh, you should not expect to see the images if you buy the Reader's Edition 
which is only about $25. But if you want the full edition, which is about the size of the book that you saw in Dr. Young's desk there, uh, then that the cost of that edition, the folio edition, is approximately $150 from Amazon. And um, I found the Red Book profound from my perspective. And the reason for that is that I, and I went through an experience like Dr. Jung's um, in 1993. Since I'm not a mental health professional, I had no idea what was happening to me. And I had no way of thinking about it. I ultimately converted it into a novel. And I thought this was just the way novel writers operated. And maybe it is. It could very well be because the material just flowed from my unconscious. And I think when you hear writers talk about writer's block, um, it, writer's block would be a blockage from the unconscious so that you can't get new material out. Uh, I feel as though that would not happen to me because I know how to evoke the unconscious to begin with now because of my experience. But uh, in past years, many uh, famous novelists have died from drug or alcohol overdoses uh, because they uh, simply couldn't get that flow from their unconscious going again. So it's, it's a very important thing to understand and it's also very important because it helps us understand why um, all teenagers are crazy for example <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, teenagers don't uh, teenagers don't believe their parents know anything and part of it is because they have a flow which hasn't yet been um, crimped, let's say, by logos, by rules. And, um, and so gradually they realize how smart their parents are because their parents in full maturity had learned how to live in our modern world. And uh, teenagers often don't have to worry about that yet. Um, Isaiah says, I tentatively, presume, I tentatively presume that our interaction with the Eros is something that happens to us, whilst the Logos is the conceptualization intended to encapsulate that meaning life in symbols and patterns. Well, um, Isaiah, I think the symbols and patterns do come from the unconscious and therefore they come from the arrow side but what happens then is that the thinking side of our psyche uh, puts those patterns into a form creates a form so if you think of uh, Leonardo's quote he who has access to the fountain does not go to the water jar. Um, we can't live our lives by drinking out of a fountain. We have to live our lives in an organized way. And so civilization, as we look at it around ourselves, is the Logos manifest. Um, but you know, if you if you have this device in your pocket, you know, it's just a brick until you put some life into it in one way or another. And even the things that it feeds to you are not alive until you put meaning into them. And that's what Eros does for you. And so with all due respect to uh, Jordan Peterson, who's given a vision to a lot of young men, let's say, um, 
he he has presented the logos the the father and you know that's all well and good all of us want to learn what the rules are when we're growing up so we can learn how to live in our society and so all young men and women have to learn rules in order to manage in society and you have to learn all the details that are in your university classes in order to get your degree but your degree doesn't give you life typically a university degree gets you one job after that you're on your own and so and, and that's exactly how it played out with me i got a ba a jd and an mba and each time i got a new degree i got a new job out of it uh, but then i had to put life into that and uh, I've had a very unique and exciting life, but no one taught me how to do that in a university. And I often joke that I only learned three things in business school, and those three things were not learned in the classroom. <laughs> and so, um, so, um, You know, we all need Eros, and I, I'm sure that Jordan Peterson, if I spoke to him directly about it, would acknowledge this, okay? In other words, I'm not being hypercritical about him, but uh, keep in mind that his background is having lived as a clinical psychologist for decades, and as a result of that, he has seen all the hardships of human life. And so when he gave his 12 rules of life, those were informed by all the hardships uh, that he had seen not only in his own life, but in his clinical background. And that doesn't mean that you're going to encounter all those horrors that he's run into in his career. And so each of us, once we get our degrees, have to take them and turn them into a life. You know, you can fall in love with a young woman or a young man and decide that you want to marry that person. But then you have to put life into that marriage. And, and I don't mean necessarily children, but you have to... Um, you have to figure out what it means, this partnership that you have with one another. And we all need that partnership because that partnership is a way of opening up the opposites within our own psyche so that we can see the other side. And typically that's what uh, a marriage does is allow you to become more whole because you see more of the other side. And so, you know, that doesn't mean that you're always perfectly masculine or perfectly feminine. It means that you have a mix of these things and your partner helps bring those out from your own psyche. And, um, and keep in mind that in this essay, uh, Dr. Zoens and Heller are making as an equivalency the word psyche and the word soul. And I think that soul has gotten a bad name because a lot of people have fallen away from religion. But the reality is that we do have an objective psyche, whatever you want to call it. and. So the question is, how do you activate that psyche, that soul, so that you have a fulfilling life? That's what individuation is about. And no matter what slings and arrows come at you. And so that's, uh, that, those are some thoughts about it. 
And so I hope this has been helpful to you in understanding something about what the Red Book is. The Red Book is, is not a Logos document. It is an Eros document. And so you won't find any rules there that you can live in your own life. As Dr. Jung said, um, you know, you can't follow me. This is my story. And so it is his story based on his background. And we each have our own story. And the question is, how do we learn to live that story? How do we learn to experience that story? And what happens with the psyche is that your psyche wants you to live fully, okay? That's, and it does that in many ways. For example, the psyche tells your body how to grow up from the time you're um, a two-celled organism, okay? <laughs> from that time on, the psyche is working to tell your body how to become you. And it continues to do that throughout the century of your lifetime. And so your psyche is doing things all the time. It's creating new cells. It's making you recognize smells and sights and sounds and tastes and feelings. Uh, all those things are coming through your psyche. And your psyche wants you to experience the fullness of your life, exactly how full you, your life can be. And so it's always pushing you to what Dr. Jung called individuate, individuate. And that's what the Red Book is, is Dr. Jung's a major part of his individuation. It doesn't mean that the same things are going to happen to you. They aren't. And um, if you read my novel, for example, you will see that my experience, which was a confrontation with the unconscious, as Dr. Jung describes it, is completely different from Dr. Jung. Um, and it's really about, it's really the story of the first woman prime minister of Japan. And there's never been such a person. Uh, and so it's my imaginative story about how she might come to exist. And if you want to read it, you can join our Dropbox. And you can do that by writing me an email to skip.conover at gmail.com. And I will add you to our Dropbox. And then in that Dropbox under, um, there's one subfolder that contains the books that I've written. I've written four books that are published. And uh, you can find that novel there. Um, and you can also find it on Amazon. It's uh, called Mako, Memoirs of a Woman. And it's by David Garretson, which is my pen name. So if you go to Amazon and look up Mako, Memoirs of a Woman, you will find my novel. You don't have to buy it, though, because it is in our Dropbox, as I say. And I'll just write it out so it's easier to... Okay, so that's the name, and this is my pen name. Um, and so it does have adult content, so please don't read it if adult content will offend you. Um, but I've had literally hundreds of people uh, read the novel, and so far no complaints. So anyway, <laughs> and a lot of praise, and a lot of praise. Okay, so... Um, so Grenad said, Eros is like the water, Logos is like the rocks and the riverbanks, but both are required to have a river. They don't exist without each other. Kind of a bad metaphor, but that's the best one I got. That's a good one. I like that one very much. Um, and uh, 
Isaiah says, La, yes, thank you for writing it out. Um, and so, anyway, uh, let me know if you need to be added to the Dropbox, and if not, then you can find the novel in the Dropbox um, under, uh, under my subfolder. Uh, and uh, so that's... I guess that's all I'll do for today. Um, on f Monday evening this week, my intention at our 8 o'clock session is to provide a session about the so-called Cirrus of Provorst, who was a woman who lived at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, she had many experiences with ghosts and visions, and uh, there's a new book, which I don't happen to have in front of me, but there's a new book that's out, which is the first volume of an eight-volume series of Dr. Jung's um, lectures, which he gave at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, which is abbreviated as ETH. And he gave many lectures there between 1934 and 1941, mm. or 1933 and 1941. This first book, he began with a history of modern psychology. And that's what it's called. And I urge you to take a look at that because it does summarize the entire development of modern psychology. And it gives you very good synopsis of all the figures in modern psychology going all the way back uh, to Paracelsus and before to the Gnostics. And, uh, and, but interestingly, in that 16 lecture series on the history, five of the lectures related to the Cirrus of Provorst. And so, you know, I certainly remember in my lifetime, my grandparents talking about ghosts. And, you know, many of us believe in ghosts or we go to horror movies to be scared in the hope that when we come out, we'll see that the world is not filled with ghosts and goblins and that sort of thing. And um, so Dr. Jung, went into this issue very heavily uh, for uh, five hours of lecture. And so I'll talk about uh, the Cirrus of Provorst uh, in our Monday evening session at 8 p.m. Eastern U.S. time this week. And I look forward to seeing you then. Um, and Isaiah says, can you lead, read my last comment if you get the chance? want to know if I understood you adequately. I presume you're not talking about the, the LOL. So let me say, so Isaiah said, so you're saying that the Logos is the, is the ascribing rationale, but it is not the life force anima, like a building without inhabitants or music in written form without the sensuous aspect of the sound. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, you know, a, a musical score is only logos until you put the orchestra and the conductor with it. <laughs> and then, then you have a symphony until then it's just a piece of paper. And, um, and, you know, if you build a building or do anything, um, you know, you, you make this watch, for example. Okay, this watch was made by Logos, okay? It was, it happens to be a Swiss watch. So it was made in Switzerland and it was made by all the rules, complete Logos. Uh, there's no arrows in the construction of that watch per se, okay, um, but the imagination to create that watch uh, is all arrows, and so, um, 
you know, the original idea for making a watch that looked looks exactly like this um, had to come from somebody's imagination at some point. And that's true if you look around the room in which you sit, everything that you can see with the exception of potted plants um, is the result of a collaboration between Logos and Eros. But um, in the construction of everything that you can see, including your computer and every other thing that you can see or everything you can see behind me, all those things were made 100% perfectly by someone following the rules. But once you have all those things, they have no life. For example, this printer that I have behind me here, uh, you know, is just a heavy piece of plastic and, and other materials until I put life into it and, uh, or I ask it to do something, then it ha takes on a life and sometimes it takes on a life of its own. <laughs> but I think you got it exactly. Um, Isaiah. And so let's see, what else do we have here? Yeah, Isaiah says, and thank you, Grenade. This stuff is kind of a handful to say the least. Well, it is because I think that a lot of people, you know, especially if you're young, let, let's understand that Dr. Jung wasn't very interested in you until you were 40, because he says, up until age 40, you're just doing research. And it's only after uh, age 40 that the meaning of your life actually emerges. And so that isn't intended to be uh, a put down. But the reality is when we're growing up and we're going to school, we're learning how to be a human being. We're learning how to be a human being in the civilization in which we live. And when we reach our maturity, in various ways, we enter into society. Um, and so, you know, in the United States, in my case, I entered the military. And so, um, you know, when they say the Marine Corps builds men, that's exactly what they mean. I mean, it means that you go in as a child who's had everything given to you, but in the Marine Corps, you learn from your new mother, who's your drill instructor or your platoon sergeant, you learn how to live maturely in the new society in which you are, which is the Marine Corps. And once you experience that, there's no going back. I mean, once a Marine, always a Marine type thing. And so, um, you know, it's not meant to be offensive, but when you're young, when you're in college, uh, you are still learning. And so one of the reasons that I'm doing these videos is because, okay, I was learning for a long time. I've made a colossal number of mistakes in my life, but I'm really glad to know about the Job archetype um, now because I realize how important that's been throughout my lifetime. And so I'm going to give you the Job ar archetype one once again contest defeat uh, lamentation and rebirth okay and you have to go through that cycle many many times and each time you go through that cycle uh, you increase the strength of your ego to deal with the slings and arrows of life and until you've been through that cycle enough times, um, you're, you're pretty fragile. Afterward, uh, you know, you can get knocked down and uh, come up again. Um, 
and and you know you can be beaten in many ways and certainly I have been beaten in many ways throughout my lifetime but what I know based on my now seven decades plus of experience is that Dr. Jung really had his act together and he really had a message for us that we all need to understand. And if we do, then we might understand ourselves at least. And if we understand ourselves, then maybe we can also understand others. Um, Grenad says the hero's journey, JBP talks about that a lot, especially in the context of ancient mythology. Uh, yeah, well, we have to go beyond the hero's journey. Remember that uh, in the Red Book, and perhaps you don't know it, but uh, on this channel, you can um, you can find a video where I read a part of uh, the Red Book called uh, Murder of the Hero. And the point is that, okay, as young men, uh, we want rules. We, we, we want people to just say, uh, this is what you have to do, do it exactly this way, and everything will be hunky-dory. And the trouble is it doesn't really work that way. I mean, um, and so I'll just give you an example. In the Marine Corps, a lot of people don't like politics. And the, the politics of your group, let's say, and every group has politics, and so most Marines will say, just tell me what I have to do and I'll do it. And most Marines are really good at that. Okay. And so you can give a Marine a mission and they will go do it. And if they can't get it done one way, they'll find another. And, um, and, but the problem is that that isn't the way you become a leader in life. The way you become a leader in life is to learn the politics, and that's the Eros part. And so the people who say, you know, just tell me what I have to do and I'll go do it, those people never rise above, let's say, major or lieutenant colonel. But the people who rise above, who become colonels and generals, typically uh, understand more how to play the politics. And so, um, so the, the sad fact is, even if you hate politics, uh, you're going to have to learn how to play politics. And that's true in every organization, whether it's with your wife, uh, remembering to compliment her on her hair anytime she's had her hair done. Uh, that's a kind of politics. And, uh, and you have to compliment her every time, even if you know it's a lie, and even if she knows it's a lie, because that shadow, that lie is golden. And this is what Dr. Jung was talking about when he talked about understanding the shadow is golden. And I was commenting this last night that uh, that's kind of what he meant, okay? And so it's golden to understand what the shadow elements are. It doesn't mean that you have to talk about them or bring them into fruition. That's what maturity is about. Maturity is about your ego being strong enough to decide between good and evil. And... Um, You know, what, what would happen if you're in battle somewhere and your best friend uh, is dying of a wound? You know that they're going to die in the next hour. They're in excruciating pain. Um, is, it, is it evil to put a bullet through your friend's head so as to put them out of their misery? And... Uh, you know, the same is true with your pets. You know, eventually pets die. They, they only live 
10 to 15 years for the most part. And so when they get to be that age, is it, um, is it appropriate to extend their life and have them suffer continuously for a long period of time? Or is it better to take them to the vet and have them euthanized? Ultimately, you end up doing that. But it's understanding that, uh, that fact. I mean, uh, one of the things I heard, I think, yesterday was something about, um, uh, you know, the act of making love uh, contains a shadow because it can create the beauty of a baby, but what's Im implicit in that, the shadow in that, is that that baby will ultimately die. And so you create, you're creating life, but you're also creating death at the same time. And uh, as adults, we recognize that, of course, in various ways. Um, you know, we, my wife and I were driving into our community last evening, and we have a lot of young deer around our community and so as we're driving down this long dark road she's saying oh look at the little baby deer isn't it cute you know bambi and i'm saying <laughs> saying to myself but not saying to her um you know that bambi is going to be venison on someone's plate next spring um and um and, you know, that Bambi is going to have to live outside in the elements for the next six months, which will be difficult. And then it's going to die and become food. And so as, a, as an adult, as a mature man, I know that. But, you know, I also know that it's not a topic that my wife wants to hear as we're driving home from work on a Friday. And so, yes, I can enjoy uh, how cute Bambi is, but at the same time, I recognize that there's a shadow element of Bambi. And, you know, the same when you go to the grocery store and you look at the meat counter, uh, how many people think about what it meant to get that meat there in your meat counter. I, I venture most women do not, uh, and, you know, they bring it home and they'll cook it. But how many of them actually think about the slaughterhouse? Not many. But nonetheless, um, people do have to work in the slaughterhouse and people do have to work in the chicken coop. To collect your eggs and those, those things are part of the shadow of our civilization and so um, so that's what maturity brings is the knowledge of, about those things and then you know you probably never should talk about the slaughterhouse with your wife uh, you know that that's just not an appropriate topic for conversation, even though you as a man have to carry that knowledge uh, with you. Um, and I'm sure if you're a woman watching this, you would really rather, I didn't talk about that right now, <laughs> and, 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 um, and you really would rather you hadn't heard this part of this discussion, which I appreciate but that's what the shadow is and so we have to recognize what our role is when we're children we're brought up and we're just learning how to be human beings when we're mature we have to look at the world as a mature being and that's quite different and so uh, okay so Bernard says, thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense. Politics is under the needs work category. For me, I naturally shy away from conformity and social group think. Uh, I'm trying to figure out 
that out so hard. Yes, it is hard. And, um, you know, it's, it's always best to have a mentor. If you have a, a mentor who's an older person or a more experienced person, um, then it's easier to play the politics. Um, and um, what, you know, the, the pain that we see our president in at the moment is the pain that comes from not having properly learned that lesson. And as a result, I mean, he basically has gotten what he wanted his whole life and he keeps jamming things through on people. And uh, because of an accident of birth, he had the privilege of doing that. Most of us don't have that privilege and he got away with it more than most. Um, but what you see is that he got away with it all the way to the, the top job in our government. And yet now, because he never learned the ropes of politics, he is like a fish out of water and he's ha having a very troubled time. And um, we can, um, you know, a part of us can feel, um, you know, empathetic toward him because, um, you know, his life as president of the United States has been awful, pretty much. And uh, I don't think that that was the case for uh, Barack Obama. I don't think it was the case for uh, George W. Bush, and I don't think it was the case for George H. W. Bush or Bill Clinton. Well, it was bad enough for Bill Clinton for a period of time, but and and richly deserved. But but uh, you know the point is that if you rise to a power uh, a level that you haven't understood the ropes all the way up, the political ropes, regardless of the organization, it can be the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts, um, whatever it is, um, if you haven't learned the ropes as you've come up, um, then, you know, it's going to be ridiculous. It's like, um, you know, can you imagine Donald Trump as a general in the Marine Corps? Mm, no. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you can't take a 21-year-old and pin um, silver uh, eagles on their collar and say, okay, Colonel, you're in charge. They wouldn't have a clue what to do. Um, and so, um, you know, you have to learn all the layers going up in order to be re properly respected. And so, uh, Granada, anyway, then to sum this up, I would recommend if you're in any group, uh, find a mentor and, and let them bring you along and teach you the ropes. Uh, you don't have to do everything by yourself. Um, and unfortunately, that's a tendency of introverts like me and like you probably uh, and so you know the idea is if you find one or two people that can bring you along that will help you quite a lot uh, in your life um, and so okay uh, so I've gone an hour and a half here and um, I need to get on to the rest of my life, the erotic side of my life, the eros side of my life, not erotic, the eros side of my life. Um, but in any case, uh, I appreciate your being here today and I'll look forward to seeing you on Monday night for the, the um, Cirrus of Provorst and you can look her up. Uh, on Wikipedia. Let me see if I can get that for you very quickly here at the end. Um, I might be able to get you the link for that. It's going to come up here momentarily. And so, 
Yeah, her name is Frederica Hauf. And uh, it'll, it might interest you to know that the part of the description about her that relates to Dr. Jung's um, and Dr. Jung's lectures was put there by me. So I too have added to Wikipedia. Uh, so, and uh, it's called uh, the Cirrus of Provorst. So, see you Monday night. Peace. Enjoy.